Today I'm in the studio with Kyle Baker. Kyle, welcome to the show. Scott, thanks for having me. I am really excited to have you here for a couple different reasons. One, because this has been a long time coming. Sure. I mean, I thought I think we originally touched base back in like February of 2023, and it's just been like kind of there was a back and forth for a long time, and uh, we we have mutual acquaintances, and so there was, we we're trying to put this whole thing together. We finally made it happen. And the other thing I'm excited about, but at the at the same time, I've just had some some feelings about some anxiety about is this conversation around human trafficking. It's been more of a hot topic as of lately, and this happens to be a field and a thing that you do on a regular basis uh, and spend a lot of time around. And you're, I think, in my conversations with you and also with other people about you, I think you're a legit resource. And so I think this is a very important conversation to be having because I don't hear a lot of it happening. And that might not be because it's, or the reasons I'm not hearing it might be because, not be because people are not having the conversation, if that makes sense. It's just not being put out there or it's being put out there in a way or maybe being suppressed in a way that you're not actually hearing it. So I don't know if that made a lot of sense, but for me, this is an extremely important conversation because I want to understand this better at a few different levels. So I'll pause and I just maybe give the audience a little bit of a background on who you are, where you come from. Yeah, for sure. So thanks again, Scott, for having me. It's humbling, exciting. I know we we're trying to kind of put together our schedules for for quite some time. Uh, before I start a little bit about me, you know, I just want you and everybody to know my my mission, right? And why I'm here today is to talk about human trafficking transparently, accurately, and really to give the landscape of what it looks like to us here in our communities because it's all around us. And some of the things I'm going to talk about uh, might be a little disturbing, but I'm a huge believer in speaking openly and honestly so that people can understand what this really looks like. So again, I, I applaud you for for having this conversation uh, on your podcast. No, I'm excited. Uh, a little bit about me. I am a police officer. I work for the Pittsburgh Police Department in Contra Costa County. Um, so to kind of give some perspective, because most people hear Pittsburgh and they're like, oh, so you're a Steelers fan. Right. Right. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. There's a Pittsburgh, California. And if you kind of had to draw a line, might be a little zigzaggy, but essentially I'm halfway between San Francisco and Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because the Bay Area and the larger geographical area around the Bay Area from Sacramento down to San Jose is a huge hotspot for sex trafficking, pimping, and pandering. And I'll, I'll definitely talk quite a bit about that. Uh, but I've been a cop for 13 years now. I uh, started in 2010. Uh, the first six years of my career uh, were spent doing a, a number of different things, uh, working patrol, field training officer. I uh, was a recruit training officer for the police academy. I've uh, been on the SWAT team for the last decade. I'm currently our SWAT team leader. In 2016, my life kind of changed a little bit. I was selected as a detective to our special investigations unit. And at the time, I was slotted as a narcotics detective. So I grew up, my dad was a cop. I grew up watching all the cop movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Common tale. Got into it. I'm like, cool, we're going to chase cars. We're going to chase after bad guys. We're going to take down huge drug kingpins. And so in 2016, I got that shot to be, become a detective. And I was super excited. And I remember extremely vividly one day, my boss coming to me and I'd, I'd been up in that position for a couple months or so. And he's like, Hey, I, I got something for you, Kyle. I'm like, cool. It's like, who are we going after? What kind of drugs are we talking? Where's it mm -hmm. going to take us? And he's like, no, it's a, a human trafficking case. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. Right. My partner who was in the unit that was one of my mentors uh, worked all of our pimping and pandering, sex trafficking cases up to that point, but he was on vacation. And so I said, okay, let, let's do it and let's get into it and see what it looks like. And that was a, a pivotal moment for me um, because it changed kind of the tra trajectory of my career and my understanding of what uh, this horrible beast of human trafficking really looks like. And, and I'll share that, that case with you a little bit. The thing about sex trafficking in the United States, and we're going to talk a lot of more about this later, is 
this old adage of it's somebody getting kidnapped off the street mm -hmm. or it's somebody being tied to a bedpost. Those kind of things do happen, especially in foreign, faraway places. But here in the U.S., we are constantly seeing young people that are vulnerable get targeted by people who know can make a profit off them. And this case is a good example of it. It was a 14-year-old girl. She had come from a hard past and from a broken home, some history of drug use, um, some sexual abuse. And those are things that we see a lot of times, sadly. Or ticking boxes, right? You know, yeah. It's just, it's a common tale, right? It's a common tale. And it's those levels of trauma that start early for some of these people. And it's, it's truly sad. And on this particular day, she had run away from home and she had been in contact with a kid. I say kid. He was 17 at the time. She was 14. And he happened to be with probably at the time, late 20s uh, gang member. Okay. And so he's like, cool. Well, why don't we pick up the 14-year-old? We'll ride around town a little bit. So they pick her up. And after they pick her up, they end up going to another house, picking up a third guy. So now you're at two adults, uh, one juvenile male, and you have our 14-year-old. Our 14 14 so they end up uh, cruising around town. This was one city over from uh, where I work. However, everything ended up being connected based on kind of where people were picked up. I, I think just time out for a second to yeah. give people perspective of sort of California, you know, when we talk about the city and you, you mentioned it's halfway between, it's not like there's this huge gap between Sacramento and San Francisco. There are, it's one city touches another city. It touches another city. It's, it's not metropolitan. Uh, there there's, it, it does get sort of rural, but these are not like, we're not isolated. Right. Yeah. These are, these cities are all touching one another all the time. It's, it's very populated now. I think so to give people, like I said, give people perspective. I think when they think the Bay area, they go, okay, yeah, you have San Francisco, maybe San Jose comes to mind, Oakland. Uh, and then the next nearest city is like Los Angeles, mm -hmm, sure. you know, and then maybe San Diego, if that even comes to mind. No, I mean, it's very populated here. So I just, to get, like I said, this is for perspective for people that are like, where in the hell are we talking about? I've had other officers on that work in the Bay Area and they go, oh, you don't work for San Francisco? Then where possibly could you work? There's lots of departments, tons of cities. There's eight counties here yeah. in, in the in the, in the the greater Bay Area. So just, again, sorry, just to put perspective for, for folks. No, I, I think that's super important. And why it's so important to this conversation specifically is if I take any other crime, right? If I take a robbery, for instance, well, a robbery is very specific. It happens in one city. It happens in one location. And it's going to be investigated by mm -hmm. that particular mm -hmm. law enforcement agency. Human trafficking is mobile. And it touches, in any given day, multiple jurisdictions. So that's a huge point that I always preach when I'm talking to chiefs of police and I'm talking to law enforcement agencies. Your borders don't really end at your borders of your city. If there's a connection to your city, run with that case, which there was in, in this uh, okay. particular circumstance. So you have uh, the three guys and, and the girl cruising around town. They go to a, a local hotel. And we're not talking the Four Seasons <laughs> <laughs> or the Westin or anything like that. We're talking uh, a low uh, room rate, CD kind of rundown hotel. They get a hotel room. And from there, they, they start drinking a little bit, right? And the 14-year-old ends up telling them about her 15-year-old friend who's at volleyball practice. Mm. And the gentleman that she is with end up saying, well, why don't we go pick her up, right? Now, here's something very interesting. The past that the 14-year-old had went through versus the 15-year-old very different. Okay. 14 year olds, like what I told you, they kind of been through it. 15 year old, not so much. Good home, parents, mm. structure, sports. And that's why this stuff can be a little scary, right? Got to be careful of who your, your Kids sons and daughters else. are hanging out with and be cognizant of that. So the 14 year old shoots a text off to the 15 year old says, Hey, 
after practice today, why don't you uh, come hang out, hang out with some guys they are cool. So sure enough, about 5.30 that day, after checking into the hotel room, they go over and they pick up the 15-year-old and they go to the hotel. They get into the hotel room. They're having a good time. There's some drugs there. There's some alcohol there. And here's what really kills me about this one. The third guy that had been picked up earlier in the day from his house, he's sitting in the corner of the room in a chair next to a table, has his arm up on the table. And he starts pulling stuff out of a bag. And the 15-year-olds are watching him, wondering, well, what's going on? What is that? Well, he pulls out a syringe. And he pulls out a little cap. And he pulls out a lighter. He pulls out a piece of plastic string. And he pulls out these little kind of brown nuggets, right? She had no idea what was going on. So dude's sitting there in the chair ties off his arm and he starts looking for a vein, right? You know that like, that sound, mm -hmm. right? That maybe when you're getting blood drawn, you hear that at the doctor. So she ends up asking him and mind you, 15, I think this guy's in his early 20s, says, well, what, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm getting ready to shoot heroin. You want to try it? She's 15. She's in a hotel room. She's with three guys doesn't know how to answer. So she says, yes. Changed her life. So right then and there in that hotel room on that day, after getting picked up from volleyball practice, she gets shot in the arm with heroin. From there, those girls are photographed in lingerie. Their photos are put into ads on websites for people to call or text for commercial sex dates. They're in that hotel room all night with those guys, drugs, alcohol, et cetera. And they live through that experience all the way to the next morning. And no doubt about it, no matter whether it's the 15-year-old or the 14-year-old and what they had been through or had not been through, a night like that changes somebody, right? And the trauma that is inflicted upon them during an experience like that is crazy. And so when I investigated that case as my first true solo human trafficking case in 2016, seven years ago, almost eight, that changed my trajectory. Did you understand, like, when you, when you got into this, I assume you interviewed these girls, mm -hmm. how long did it take for you to kind of understand the depths of what all this, all this is and was? Years. Yeah, I think that's an important factor here because this is not... This is understanding human beings at a very deep level and the evilness that exists as well as how uh, you, you just kind of, we, we kind of went through that, like how ticking boxes make somebody that much more vulnerable or that much more likely to, to be a victim and how, again, ticking boxes on the other and how easy it can be for somebody to get pulled in on the other side. This is, this is pretty complex. Um, I could be very naive to this, but I do have daughters. And so I, I do understand how they can be influenced very, very quickly and very, I say easily by the peer group, by the peer pressure and um, the fear of not being included or being discounted or not feeling important. And then on the flip side of that, how, what feeling important uh, can do to somebody in terms of their decision-making and their attitudes about things. So it's tragic. Sorry. I just wanted to, to ask. So you, it takes you a while to figure this out, but in the moment, let's go back to the moment you're you've now been changed. Yeah. So, I mean, that was an eye-opening experience to, to say the least. And from there, you know, I found that, um, I wish human trafficking didn't exist without a doubt. Uh, but if it does, I felt like there's a different level of satisfaction in trying to help that problem. Um, than what I thought I was getting into with drugs, et cetera. Super important part about law enforcement. I just found a different calling through mm -hmm. that experience. So from there, um, that led me down a path. I spent many years uh, investigating commercial sex cases. Uh, I've done hundreds of them. I was a member of a human trafficking task force for five years where I held leadership positions. 
Um, I ended up getting promoted, became the supervisor of that unit. Uh, I traveled the state of California to teach, teach police officers, teach district attorneys, I teach victim advocates. I speak to community groups. I've created classes um, for California Post when it comes to human trafficking. Um, and really o- over the years through trial and error. And, that, and that's something that I, I point out all the time. I haven't always got this stuff right. Yeah, there's no playbook for this. There's none. Yeah. There's none, right? And that's one thing whenever I teach cops, especially, I will sit there and, you know, if I'm teaching cops from all over the state, like I do a couple of times a year in, in one of the detective classes here in uh, California Post puts on, I'll pick one from down south and I'll pick one from up north. And I'll say, hey, I, I bet you that if a burglary happened in either one of your towns or cities, you guys would probably investigate it pretty much mm. the same way. Yeah, got it. Mm-hmm. The book's written. Mm-hmm. So now if I drop a human trafficking case, especially if a juvenile is involved, or maybe even... If there's not a juvenile and it's a tough case, because most of them are, I bet you that you guys might go about it a little bit differently. And that's because collectively we're still writing this playbook, right? I imagine there's a lot of other factors too. I mean, you mentioned like the texting. So there's a technology piece here that's that's interesting in terms of the communication and the way this happens uh, versus, you know, burglary. Like you have to be on site. You go to to a thing, to a house, to a business, whatever it happens to be. And, you know, you break in, there's a, there's a MO there that's very well understood. You've seen it all sure. kind of at this point versus now I'm sure you're discovering and learning new things kind of all the time with the platforms that are out there from like social media to dark web stuff to whatever. I mean, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, just like anything else in 2023, that's technology driven. Sex trafficking is, is not, um, foreign to that by any stretch of the imagination. And so in our cases, uh, what we find is that the greatest amount of evidence that we could ever find or use is usually located within the digital world. So whether that's text messages, social media, et cetera. I'm telling you right now, and as a dad myself like you, and for all the parents out there, I've investigated so many cases that start from social media and, you know, kind of back to my mission of dispelling myths, right? A lot of times we think of the movie Taken Mm -hmm. um, and we think, okay, cool. If somebody's going to be sex trafficked, it's not going to be my kid. My kid's not going to get snatched off the street, kidnapped, tied to a bed, whatever. And I would, I would argue that you're probably right. That, That doesn't happen a lot here in the U.S., luckily. However, if you have a young daughter that has a social media platform that is open to the public, that is accessible, at some point in time, somebody's going to contact her. I'm not saying it's a sex trafficker necessarily, but it's somebody that probably doesn't have the best of intentions. <laughs> Jesus. I'm not a 14-year-old <laughs> girl. I don't look anything like that. <laughs> yeah. I have a social media page that is public and I've been contacted yeah. for shit like that, right? Crazy. I mean, most people have like the one, something that winds up in the DM like, what in the hell? You know, what is this? Some, something stupid. But you, you, I discount it. Like I, you just heard me go like this. I kind of chuckled about it and laugh it off, but that's where it starts. So check this out. Another case that I had um, was a young lady. I learned a lot from this case. So it was a, a case that uh, our patrol officers had gotten a call uh, from a basically a concerned friend that said, hey, uh, my friend, she's uh, over 18. I think she was in her uh, early 20s. I, I think she had this experience where she was pimped out okay. and uh, don't really know what to do, but here's who she is, et cetera. So the patrol officer did a great job. They went out there and, and that's what, you know, for, for anybody listening in law enforcement, you got to train your patrol cops. Right. It's, it's great to have investigators. It's great to have people that have specialty in this line of work, just like anything else. But your patrol cops are the ones seeing it every day. Yeah, they're the ones having the contacts, right? 100%. Just as much as your Starbucks bar, barista is seeing this every day or you know the person that's taking your order at In-N-Out or the nurse that works in an ER. This stuff's all around us. 
So when it comes to cops, we got to train our patrol cops. And in this particular instance, this officer did a good job of, of giving kind of a, a preliminary statement. And then as a detective, I, I ended up investigating the case. This whole thing started on Instagram over a DM. Mm. And this, this young lady was having some trouble in her life. And she was expressing that on social media. And that's the thing is most pimps are master manipulators. Some use violence without a doubt, but most of them, they're good with their words. They really are. And so this guy that she had known in high school, he was the prom king, kind of a stud, right? Mm -hmm. uh, reaches out to her via DM. And she's feeling important. She starts talking to her. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I know you're having a hard time, et cetera. And through a series of events and a series of messages, ends up introducing the thought of, well, you know what? I know you're hurting for money. I know how we can go make some. And so that blossoms into him picking her up from home in the city I work in and taking her out to Oakland to the Blade. Do you know what a Blade is? Mm -hmm. A Blade is essentially an open market for sex trafficking. And when you think open market for bad stuff, you think, oh, okay, s somewhere far away. No. Oakland, Sacramento, San Jose, Vallejo, they all got them. And this is an area for exploiters to take young victims to or older victims, have them walk around on display with lingerie, bikinis, et cetera, and get picked up for commercial sex dates. And so this guy takes this girl out to the Blade in Oakland, has her get out of the car, tells her what she's going to do. You're going to go have sex for money or do whatever those guys tell you to that pick you up, and you're going to give me the money. So... That transpires. She feels like she wants to get away, but he's watching. She has a horrible night and series of events that happen to her. And that ends up being a pinnacle moment in her life that, that changed her. And it all started over a DM. Mm -hmm. I want to, there's a couple of things because you're hitting some, some keynotes here with regard to, I think, what people's perception is on how this stuff happens. Yeah. You're talking about like this open market and uh, you see that shit in the movies. Go back to the movie Taken. And yeah. If you've seen the movie, there's there's a couple of spots in there where they're, they're basically, these girls are for sale. I want to go back to the first incident that you had and these girls that, have, that end up spending the night in this hotel. Is it one night? That's all it takes, right? So I think what people, so I, I, I understood this coming in that this like sex trafficking is not you get kidnapped, you get tied to a bed, and then you're there for months and months, addicted to drugs, and you know these horrible people let other horrible people do things to you for money. This is one night, and this is a money maker for them. It's profitable, and then they're done, and then they move on to the next the next victim. I imagine some of this, is, and that's what happened with these two. Sure. Or does this, you know, can continue with one or more of them for a while or can we go back yeah, to that real quick? Because yeah. I, again, like there's this, what you see in the movies and what's been, been portrayed, you know, recently and, and yeah. kind of how you see things like, most well, people understand like it can happen in a few hours and, and you're, and you're, and they move on. Yeah. In the blink of an eye. Now here, here's the, the sad reality. A lot of times, in fact, most of the times, uh, when a victim is exploited, it is for longer periods of time. So it's oftentimes somebody who has linked on to this pimp or mm. exploiter. And until something disrupts that cycle, whether it's law enforcement or it's family mm. or some type of event, they will oftentimes be exploited day in and day out for long periods of time. With that being said, this last one was a really good example, especially when it came to the 15-year-old. Now, the 14-year-old had had some experiences in the past, unfortunately. But the 15-year-old had never been involved in this stuff at all. So I think you make a really good point that you can have almost that acute type Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Right? Where 
maybe it's a, a moment of weakness for a young person that is feeling vulnerable, is feeling down about themselves, and this person comes along and makes them feel like they are on top of the world, but there's a catch, right? You're going to go out and sell your body for it. Um, but the vast majority of victims that we come across, whether they're young, um, juveniles, or they're young adults, what we see is that they've more than likely been involved in this for long periods of time. And that makes it very difficult because what we see is a distrust with law enforcement. We see something called trauma bonds, which essentially is this idea that even though a lot of these young victims are treated horribly, there's violence inflicted upon them. They're controlled. I mean, you have pimps out there that will tell you when you can eat, when you can go to the bathroom, when you can take a break after you've made a certain amount of money. So even though these horrible things have happened, there's this cycle that happens and these guys know it to where they will provide some guidance and some feel good and then there's some violence and then there's back to feeling good and then there's violence. It's very similar to what we see in a certain uh, domestic violence situation. I was just going to say, I mean, this doesn't sound unfamiliar at all with regard to what you see in a, a lot of abusive relationships. A hundred percent. It's the same thing. And it's, it's kind of, it, it can seem crazy for most people, right? That, you know, how, because a, a lot of, a lot of these victims, they don't have a gun to their head. They don't, mm -hmm. they're not tied to something. They're not handcuffed to a post. Mm -hmm. And so a common question I get is, well, why don't they just leave? <laughs> just, just, just go. I'm sure that's a common question. I, I mean, I would like to think that I, that's not a question I would ask. I think I would try to think that I, I understand at a deeper level. I think I, I have to imagine that part of this is the dehumanization that happens during these processes that they're feeling and that because of the way they're being treated, but then also how they're being looked at as a victim in that way too, to a certain extent, maybe they're a victim, but they're also being dehumanized because of what they've done, what they've been exposed to by maybe some law enforcement, by uh, let's, uh, whatever it might be, social programs, uh, other officials, in, in people that they come in contact with along the way, they feel like they have no hope and they're not, they're worthless to some extent. And um, what else is left for them? Uh, they're just, they're, they're used up. Sure. Um, I imagine that's got to be part of the difficulty that you have from a law enforcement perspective, just trying to get them to like, no, really, I'm here to help you. No, really. And, you know, they're, Half of it's like, no, I've seen what you do to people out on the street, whatever that is, right? right? And, or, um, yeah, I've talked to your kind before and, you know, you think I'm a piece of shit. So I'm likewise going to treat you the same and you're not going to get anything out of me. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing. So, and I think it's important to put almost a historical perspective to it. In the 80s, 90s, even into the 2000s, prostitutes were prostitutes, right? And the... What do you mean by that? The go-to for law enforcement was to look at commercial sex as a prostitution problem. Got it. Meaning that what we know now, the large am amount of individuals involved in the commercial sex trade are victims. For a lot of years, law enforcement, we thought that we could almost put a Band-Aid on the problem by just arresting them. By just taking the prostitutes That's off it. the street. That's yeah. it. We're we'll, gonna, just, we'll just find them. We'll just put them yeah. in jail or whatever. Yeah, we'll, we'll arrest them. We'll put them in jail for a night. It's, like trying, it's, it's <laughs> the same issue with the drug problem. That's huge. Like you arrest the drug addict for being a drug addict. How does that solve the problem? And, it, and the answer is we've seen no. <laughs> Resoundingly. <laughs> Resoundingly. Yeah. And, the, and the same goes in, in this area. And so for a long time, that was the go-to in law enforcement. Mm. We've come a long way in understanding that this world is exploiter-driven. There's also a huge part of it that's the demand side that we cannot ignore. If there was no demand for it's opportunity, something, mm -hmm. right, that something does not exist. So... However, for us in law enforcement, it took us a lot of years to really look at. And you know, one, one thing I always kind of point out, you'll hear me say girls, you'll hear me say women. 
it is very important to realize that there are victims of all shapes, sizes, et cetera, right? But what we see mostly, especially in our communities, are, are these young women and girls. And for a long time, we looked at them as criminals, okay? Mm-hmm. And that pendulum over the years has changed because we've fallen on our face. We've had a lot of survivors come out and tell their stories Mm -hmm. and talk about some of the interactions that we as cops always have not gotten right. And so now in 2023, I think we're doing a better job. We still have a a little ways to go for sure. Um, However, a common theme that comes up is that distrust with law enforcement because victims are still not sure, right, if law enforcement is going to come and say, you're the bad guy, Mm. right? Why are you, how could you be doing this horrible thing where you're selling your body? Well, they're doing it for X, Y, and Z because they're forced to or encouraged to or they feel like they have to based on economic means, the list goes on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, for us, building past those barriers, you're 100% right. Talking to human trafficking victims is a very, very difficult thing. And there are so many layers of trauma that you or I or anybody couldn't, else couldn't possibly understand. No. Yeah. Unless you've lived through it, you'll never understand what they go through, but you can be compassionate about it. And you can understand that it is going to be a difficult process for you as a police officer. It's going to take time to build trust but that the outcome can be potentially providing that victim with a pathway to change her life and or get an exploiter off the streets so they can't do it to somebody mm-hmm. else. Okay. Let's go to back to kind of the beginning of this. Yeah. And I want to talk about some of the perceptions, you know, that are out there yeah. uh, and kind of where they come from. So stick with me on this for a sec. So when I was growing up, uh, we called this kidnapping, right? And, and, and what we were warned about as kids and what we were frightened about as kids was the guy rolling up to us on our walk home from school in the van offering us candy or a puppy, right? Or saying he knew our parents and that they were in trouble and that we, they had asked him to come pick us up or something like that. This is, this is what was being told to us. Don't get in the car with a stranger. Don't take candy from a stranger. Don't, you know, here's our, here's our, our safe word or our secret word, you know, if anybody ever comes to you, if they don't use this word, don't get in the car. These are all things that I learned as a kid, but it was kidnapping. And, you know, we saw movies and there were true stories and there were even movies that came out. Um, it'll, it'll come to me in a second about kids being, uh, you know, specifically Adam Walsh, the Adam Walsh story, you know, for people that remember, um, you know, his dad was, 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 uh, was heavily involved in, fighting against human trafficking, specifically kidnapping of kids. His, his son was kidnapped in the mall right, right up from underneath their nose. Uh, and they later found him, found him dead, uh, abused and dead. That was very big to me as in the eighties as a kid. Like I remember this, it stuck with me. The kids were on the back of milk cartons, you know, the pictures were on the in milk cartons at, um, you know, in public places you would see the posters, you know, missing that kind of stuff. That's how kidnapping or k- human trafficking was just was sort of, I guess that's how we learned about it. Uh, and so it was, again, don't talk to strangers. Um, and that was pretty much it. Now, I think my parents, before that, obviously they were trying to protect me, but their experience was even a little bit different. Like this shit wasn't talked about. You know, like the incidents of how many kids were being abused certainly wasn't making the airwaves like it makes it now. Not that it wasn't happening. Then I have no idea what the statistics were then, but their experience with it was much different than mine. And now we have this newer generation and they're hearing human trafficking, human trafficking, human trafficking. And then they're, they're seeing movies like taken, right. Which makes for a really good story. I mean, so good. I think they made like four more of those movies, right. (laughs) They don't stop. They don't stop. It's like fast and furious. Right. And it's sensationalized that some, somebody's going to come to rescue and it's, it's always happening in a third world country. It's never happening in the United States. Uh, And by the way, it's never happening in a country that borders the United States. It's always happening across across the world, somewhere else, there's a very specific demographic that does this. It's the people that have the most amount of money, right? It's this, you know, almost like this upper echelon. And it always goes to, you know, those, the richest, you know, the politicians and all that kind of stuff. And then we have now, now, you know, more recently than that, we have a movie that's come out, The Sound of Freedom, uh, which got a lot of press very, I would say kind of actually very briefly. And then it 
it kind of has started to disappear a little bit. Uh, and so people are seeing this and that's their introduction to what human trafficking is. And again, it's happening in a foreign country now based on true events, but happening in South America and then how this thing kind of trickles into the United States. But, and I don't want to say it wasn't well-developed. I think it was a well-done movie, but I had some things when I walked into that movie, some, some preconceptions based on my own knowledge, uh, trying to stay up on this stuff. Again, I'm a dad with daughters. I live in a community. We're in a society. I recognize this stuff is happening. I've seen it happen here across the street, literally across the street from me. During the COVID um, lockdowns that were happening around here, we have a notorious hotel. There's now been shut down, okay. partly as a result of this, but ma major hub for drug and human trafficking. And I, during, for those people that have heard my story, know that, you know, when the George Floyd incident happened, streets of San Jose are a little bit nutty. I came down, camped out in my business because I don't want to see my business damaged, broken into, burned down, whatever the hell. And I li lived here for like three to five, three days like straight. And then I kind of made some back and forth but I was staying the night here for a while because of the activity that was happening outside. I was just watching it. Vans pulling up, right? Girls getting out, going into the hotel in there for a couple hours coming back, like literally van loads. It was like a turnstile over there. And so again, my, my introduction to human trafficking was like, this is certainly prostitution that's happening here. And, and, and the police were over there a lot, shaking the place down and making arrests, but they see this movie and it's still, I think there's still some disconnect there. Uh, I thought it was well done. There's some value, entertainment value that's there. Um, and that might sound like bad to say, but I think the way, way it was put together, this is my take on it. When I walked out, I was angry. Hmm. I already knew what the story was. I had heard a very long interview done with the with the lead actor in the movie. I knew about the the person that he was portraying. I'd spent, you know, quite a bit of time kind of just trying to understand who that was the best you could through the different outlets that exist, call it the interwebs and so forth, a couple of podcasts and things like that. So I understood the story. And when I walked out, I walked out super angry. It's just, this is disgusting. Like it's as disgusting as I ever thought it was, but it was kind of right there and portrayed and on the cinema. And then the next part of it was, I was like, but that didn't even really scratch the surface from my understanding of what's really going on um, as a whole. Because again, it really didn't talk about what was going on in the United States. And I know it's happening literally across the street from me. So how does this relate? And so part of it was walking out thinking like, if I saw this and I really didn't know or I didn't really have a lot of background information on this, I would look at this and go, yeah, but that's not happening in my backyard. That's just something that happens in a foreign country, you know, thousand miles away, and it's awful, and we should be doing something about it. But it's also in another country a million miles away, and we have our own problems here, not, not really thinking about it in that way. And the other part of it was is they, there were, it was alluded to, but within the, within the film, you don't, they can't really get into the level of disgusting and evil that actually happens with these, these poor kids and people just in general. But in this, this case was really focused on the kids knowing about what, what happens to them, um, sexually, psychologically, emotionally. And, and so I, I, I had, I'd struggle with that. And I was like, man, they left, I think so much out that would make an impact on people. Then I also walked away going, well, if I wanted to show my 11 year old something like a movie or something to give them some lo level of education. And I didn't really get this till after talking with, with CC about it. Like I, w I wouldn't want to have a film that was so graphic mm. and so disturbing that I couldn't you know, in good conscience, show it to my teenage daughter or son or whatever else to give them some kind of an education. So in that respect, I kind of just like, well, they had to do what they had to do. And they also had to put it in the major mo mainstream movie cinema and, and not have it completely banned. Mm -hmm. So there's these pieces to it. And I was really struggling with them. I'm like, and this is why this, this, this conversation is so important to me. So I'm my parents' generation, I'm my generation, we have this new generation. And you just talked about what prostitution you, how it used to be viewed, how it's being viewed now, or how it's being handled from law enforcement, there seems to be this huge wide open gap between what people really think this is. And you painted a good picture there with regard to the, you know, what happened in the hotel room that one night for those two, those two girls versus again, being tied to a bedpost mm -hmm. and, you know, trafficked, you know, wherever in, in some other place in the world. How do you change the perception 
that people have of this and bring it to the forefront without them just, again, turning their head going, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't, I can't, sure. I can't watch this. I can't listen to this or whatever. But at the same time, grabbing them by, I just grab them by the shirt. You know, and just shaking them into you. You need to pay attention here, and we need to talk about this. How do you, how do you bridge that gap, man? Because there seems like there's a really large one, so much so that I think a lot of this is being suppressed in the media. Like I know it is because we're, again, we're seeing it happen. Like, how many cases are you working right now, and how many are making the paper? Sure. I mean, that's a legit question, right? I mean, how many how many cases are out there right now that people never fucking hear about? A lot. And, and that's the thing is, <clears throat> you know, you'll a lot of times see maybe some big headlines that happen, you know, when a case is fully adjudicated and, you know, the the sentencing is, is you know, you'll see the headline, hey, sex trafficker gets X amount of years for yeah. whatever. And so you see them here and there. And then you'll see, press releases from, you know, whether it be agencies or district attorney's offices, et cetera, maybe about operations, some success stories and stuff like that. But the truth is it, to, to unpack that a little bit, there are so many people in our communities that are just kind of left behind this conversation that are true victims of either pimping, pandering, sex trafficking that don't get the attention they deserve because there is this misrepresentation of what this is. So I, I think to, to start, I think it's really important to, to kind of define human trafficking. And there's, there's kind of a myriad of, of definitions and it depends what area you're in if you're going to go like a lawful definition. But the most basic definition that I can provide is human trafficking is forcing somebody else into the sex trade or forced labor. Now that forcing can be done through different ways, whether that is by fear, by violence, by fraud, by coercion. So sex trafficking in and of itself is kind of this one side of the coin. Well, on the other side of the coin, and really important to understand, I say this a lot and, and I'm going to say it, I'll say it again, then I'll, I'll kind of explain it. All sex traffickers are pimps but not all pimps are sex traffickers. Got it. Because okay. why? And this really comes down to the law, especially here in California, for people to understand. All that a pimp is, is somebody who knowingly gets proceeds from somebody else's prostitution. That's it. So somebody who goes out, maybe drives a victim around, drops him off on a street corner, collects the money afterwards, that's a pimp, okay? A sex trafficker, first off, if you pimp or pander, and pander, consider it almost encouraging somebody into prostitution. The word that is used synonymously is procuring somebody. Mm -hmm. But essentially, the acts of pandering are things like driving somebody to and from a commercial sex date, hosting their ads online, coaching them, encouraging them, et cetera. The beautiful thing, one thing that California does have right in terms of the commercial sex laws is when it comes to trafficking of a minor, anybody that simply attempts to pimp or pander a juvenile is guilty of sex trafficking. So sex trafficking is one of those things where it may be as simple as kind of the story I described, but it might even be more as simple as uh, a person meets a young juvenile on social media. They decide to get into a straight business relationship that benefits the both of them for whatever reason. Okay. And they go out. He drives her around to different hotels, okay. makes money, tells her anytime, like, hey, you can go, you can leave, et cetera. But that whole time, sex trafficking is occurring. And make no mistake about it, there's probably some manipulation that's going into that. There's some uh, ways of keeping tabs and keeping that victim kind of on the hook. But there's no kidnap. There's no gun against the head. There's no uh, idea that somebody is, you know, being mm -hmm. completely held against their will to do these things. And that's what's really important to understand. And when you bring up Sound of Freedom, right, that good movie, okay? entertaining movie does paint a picture of some really unfortunate things that do happen around the world. But 
just in the phrase itself of human trafficking, when you hear the word traffic, you think like movement, right? You think, okay, well, to traffic somebody, right. you have to take them from point A to point B. Well, that's smuggling. Okay, that's the definition of smuggling. If I'm smuggling a human being, I am taking them from point A to point B. That's not what the definition of trafficking is. And Got that's it. really important for people to understand as well. So you have this gap that occurs between this thought process that human trafficking is a this, this phenomenon that we don't understand that happens in other places that is the movement of humans and they're tied up or forced, et cetera. The well, smuggling part. The smuggling part. Whereas every day, I can promise you that no matter what kind of community you live in, if you live in a big city, you live in a rural area, maybe someplace that is more affluent, maybe someplace that's struggling more economically, it doesn't really matter. There are victims of human trafficking that are walking around right in front of you that are being taken to have sex with people at hotel rooms, in cars, at houses, and so on. And so to bridge that gap of knowledge, it takes exposure and it takes people willing to have a, an honest conversation mm -hmm. about what this looks like that your daughter or your son can be subjected to this stuff right here in the U.S., right here in our communities. And all it takes is somebody that sees some type of vulnerability most of the time, and they just attack that vulnerability. They exploit that, and they find ways to talk or force by violence people into going out and having these sex dates. So it's a huge conversation. It's a huge thing to unpack but my fear and concern is when you see a movie like Sound of Freedom, I love that people are talking about this stuff. I love that people are talking about human trafficking and they're wanting to get involved and they're wanting to put their dollars towards something or they're wanting to get educated. And I, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. But I've investigated hundreds of these cases and I can tell you about one where somebody was, was truly kidnapped. And that's one out of hundreds. Really? And that one was pretty, um, pretty, pretty crazy. Um, but again, guess what? Started on a dating website. Yeah. And in this particular case, this uh, young girl, 18 years old, um, very naive, very um, just kind of almost sheltered uh, young girl. She meets a guy online and... You know, they, it, it was, uh, back in the day was this uh, website called plenty of fish. Right. And it was a, a dating website. And so they meet on this platform and they're talking. And what's really interesting looking back, once we kind of peel the layers back on that case, looking at all their messages, the worst and the raunchiest, the nastiest, the dirtiest it ever got was him saying that she had pretty hair. Wow. A normal compliment, right? That you right. might compliment your significant other. Hey, your hair's pretty. That's but that great. was enough. That was enough to give her attention. So over months of grooming, which is a huge, huge phrase in the human trafficking world where somebody will leech on to a victim and really groom them to what they want to achieve by selling that person. And that grooming process can take a while to get somebody to trust you. So... She ends up deciding to go on a date with this guy. He picks her up from her house. Says, mom, dad, I'll see you later, right? Going to the movies. Just a date. Just a date. Should have been a red flag when he didn't come up to the door, right? Parked, <laughs> parked around the corner. And I'll tell you what, if it, someday when that inevitable time comes that my daughter dates... <laughs> Not until she's 30, right? A hundred percent. But <laughs> that, that dude's coming up to the front door to say hi. Like there's no, there's no. I had rules. My, <laughs> my, my daughter was very, she's, she's, my oldest is 21 now. Yeah. She's kind of doing her own thing, but, um, you know, she doesn't live at the house anymore. But yeah, that was a rule. Mm -hmm. uh, she knew that. She explained that very, well, I'll just put it this way. Call it grooming if you want, but she groomed the dudes. Like, yeah, yeah so yeah. I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to come over to the house. Here's what's going to happen. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're going to meet dad. You're, you're going to meet dad. And this is what it's probably going to feel like. Just shake his hand, make eye contact, and don't call him sir. He doesn't yeah. want to be called sir. <laughs> he makes him feel like his dad. Yeah, exactly. That's my old man. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, uh, red flag. Right? Red flag, right? Um unfortunately not uncommon in this generation, but anyway, um, so picture up, 
takes her around town a little bit. Um, and then she thinks it's kind of weird because they get on the freeway and the movie theater's in town. The way you get on the freeway. Mm-hmm. They go, uh, and again, another good example of kind of how the Bay Area works. Um, gets picked up in Pittsburgh. Gets taken out to a city called Richmond, which is in kind of the west part mm-hmm. of the Bay Area. Not not too far from Oakland and in San Francisco. Right. Yeah. They cruise over there. Uh, he goes into a friend's house, comes out, has like a pill in his hand, right? And he's like, hey, you need to take this. And by this point, she already kind of described feeling a little scared, feeling a little weird. He was driving super fast, a little bit verbally aggressive, that kind of stuff. So she takes it. What I'm guessing that probably was, was like an ecstasy type pill based on how she described. She felt kind of euphoric. Um, and, that, and that's what I tend to think that that was, uh, that, that she was given. So then uh, they start driving to San Francisco. They're on the Bay Bridge. And now she's like, finally kind of what's going on. And she gets her cell phone out. And he says, give me your cell phone. Now. So she does. Give me your wallet takes out her ID, snaps a picture of it and says, I'm kidnapping you. I now know your exact address. I know where your family lives. You're going to do exactly what I say. Or they're going to get killed or hurt, whatever he said. So he drives her over the Bay Bridge to San Francisco. They're going to go to the Blade out there. There's too many cops around though. So he decides to come back, goes to Oakland. Gives her her marching orders. This is what you're going to do. Get out of the car. You're going to walk around. You're going to have sex for money. Simultaneously, while all this is going on, the family, totally in tune, awesome family. They think she's at the movies. Well, now they're in word because now we're kind of, you know, into the, the wee hours of the morning. Okay. She's at home. So they've called our police department and we're doing all the things we normally can do. We have no idea any of this is going on. We just know that she left with a guy and she's over 18. She went on a date. Mm-hmm. So all the normal things that happen uh, most of the time with a missing person, right? You know, reports taken, start working leads, but there's really not a whole lot to go off of. It's not like the movies where you can just like ping a cell phone and it gives you this beautiful, perfect spot of where somebody is. Most of the time when you ping a cell phone, it's like within 4,000 meters of somewhere. So you can do all these great things, but in all reality, it's... it's very Especially if you're in an urban setting. Yeah, it's very difficult to find somebody. 4,000 square meters, it could be 500 yeah, apartments. Yeah, I mean, and then some. So uh, on on that night, she she ends up walking the blade in Oakland. She does dates for money. She ends up getting taken to a, a hotel, a Motel 6 on the Pinole richmond border, which is kind of another highlight of how mobile this stuff is, right? Well, so the next day, um, the, the parents kind of start, they have a, a joint uh, cell phone account. So the parents are able to get in and see what number she's been kind of communicating with and they end up calling it. And the guy answers and he says, I don't know what you're talking about. Very key piece of evidence later on was that we found right after that phone call happened, he changed his phone number with the cell phone carrier. And why would you do that if you weren't doing something that you weren't supposed mm-hmm. to do? Mm-hmm. So... Uh, long story short, she ends up um, being held against her will, uh, scared for her life, scared for her family's life. And she goes into a, a restaurant with the guy uh, later on night two or three and ends up using an employee's cell phone, calls parents, parents call police, police get out there. They find out what's going on and then it comes back to us to be investigated. In his cell phone later on, we found the picture of him holding the ID. Mm-hmm. And then here's what's really wild. He had researched sex trafficking. He like had, a, he, yeah. I, I like an internet search? Uh-huh, uh, YouTube. <laughs> he had uh, screenshotted articles of what penalties look like for that behavior. <laughs> and it was all then, you know, there in a, a cell phone after a, a search warrant was written or whatever. So that case was, um, uh, very unique in the sense that that does not happen a lot at all. Um, however, it's important and uh, I want people to know that while you do have on one spectrum, you do have horrible things like that that do happen very rarely. On the same spectrum, just on the other side, you have the the more often day in and day out people being manipulated and trapped in this world. Well, it all starts in the same place though. 
Sure. Like she got forcibly taken at one point, but she didn't forcibly get into the car. It wasn't like she got, again, going back to my, this is what our fear was, is like the van comes down the street, the guy jumps out, he snatches the person, the kid up, and then you're in the van, you know, nobody knows or whatever. That's not what's happening here. It's, it's a process. And again, there's like this misconception of this is what it'll look like. And, or, you know, people are getting, they're being drugged unknowingly and then being, being taken into this stuff. And, you know, that's why you don't go to the nightclubs or whatever else. Like it's, it starts from my, my, my understanding of this is it starts well before that. hundred percent. Well, well before that, while those things can happen that I, I would, that, the the, there's a propensity for it to happen. The frequency of that happening is much less than what you're speaking about. hundred percent. And <clears throat> the truth is, and, and I, I say this and I, I think it's an indicator and kind of the, the forefront of any challenge or scary thing that can affect our youth you have to watch out for a change of behavior. And I'm not saying because a change of behavior in your son or daughter means that they're being sex trafficked by any stretch of the imagination. But what we commonly do see with people who are thrust into this life is at some point in time, parents can look back or family members can look back and say, you know what, I, I did notice a change in behavior. And here's how some of those kind of look. Do they have somebody in their life that you know that they're seeing that they're unwilling to talk about? Okay. Are they showing up at home with items that you didn't buy and you know that they can't afford? That's a huge part, right? Is a technique commonly used by exploiters is to spoil somebody through gifts, through presents, etc. What kind of clothing are we wearing, right? Did we did we start wearing some more revealing stuff? Did we start dressing differently? How are we doing in school? Mm. Was there a change? Mm -hmm. Did we stop going to class? And the number one most important thing, what's going on in social media, right? And it's 2023. There are a lot of positives about social media for a lot of different things. But as a parent, you have to be up and watching and monitoring and paying attention to your kid's social media. And that goes for anything, right? That's the generic law enforcement advice to anybody out there is... That's what I was uh, just going to say. 100% is, is keeping an eye on that because of other things, right? Is your kid being bullied on social media? Is your kid uh, talking about drugs on social media? Is somebody trying to influence your kid to try drugs on social media? Well, same thing goes for this world of, of doing dates for money. And here, here's what's scary about it. I talk about this quite a bit. There's a glamorization aspect. It's just going there. Like you, they're making tons and tons of money oh, dude. being out there on things like OnlyFans and any other number of things. And, and so here's the thing is we as human trafficking investigators spend a lot of time on social media and we look at our victims' profiles. If you go to a human trafficking victim's profile, you are going to see Photos, selfies in nice restaurants, F Flemings eating mm. filet mignon, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, taking a picture on a yacht in front of a boat, maybe on the hood of a, a nice Maserati or something like that. And these, these young victims are painting this picture on social media that they are living the life, right? They're making bands. They're making money. They're making... Mm -hmm. uh, hand over fist. They, they got all this cash in their pocket. They're getting taken care of. They're traveling the world. They're going to Las Vegas. Right. They're going to all it's vacations stuff. and yeah. And what's sad about that is that draws other young people into that lifestyle because they're like, well, wait a minute. Okay. If, if all I really have to do is go do these dates and just kind of block my mind out from that and I get paid these thousands of dollars to do it, well, would I rather be poor and not have money or would I rather do that? If I was to create a side-by-side -side social media page for a human trafficking victim that actually had the real life photos of what's in their phones, it would be a very different picture because what those social media platforms don't show is the bruises from their exploiters. It doesn't show the hospital trips 
because of the constant sexual abuse and stress that they're put under. It doesn't show when a pimp doesn't like the way that a girl's makeup is, so he beats her for it and then makes her rub a makeup palette on her face as he pours drinks on her in his bedroom. Hmm. It doesn't show the text messages between a pimp and a victim that basically belittle, make them feel like the scum of the earth, make them feel like they're nobody, and then build them back up. If I was to create a social media page with all that, I bet you some people would be like, hey, I don't want anything yeah, to do with it. that. Right. But that's the reality. And those are the things that, that I've been exposed to over the years that I, I want that message to get out there is that especially to not only, and I, I say this, I've talked to a lot of community groups about having good conversations with your young men. Okay, I'm glad you brought this up right now for a couple of reasons. One, because we're going to get into some, some statistics here sure. that I pulled up <clears throat> as it relates to the male-female component and dynamic in this. But we also haven't talked about, we've been talking about our daughters. Yeah. And I think because it's obviously very relatable and I'm sure that's what you deal with probably the majority of the time. But it's not just females that are being trafficked in this way. And so I want to talk about that too. So we're talking about having those conversations with 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 young men. What What's the conversation? Well, it's two things. <clears throat> You're 100% right. There, there is no uh, typical victim. They're, they come in, in all sorts of shapes, sizes, colors, et cetera. This, this ugly thing of human trafficking affects everybody. But what I do spend a lot of time in our communities talking about is to our young men out there is this world is not all cracked up or it is not, is not what it's cracked up to be. If you listen to music, if you watch movies, and even if you think about some of the, um, some of the things we all laugh at, uh, the movie, The Other Guys, right? Will Ferrell and, and Mark Wahlberg, funny yep. movie. And there's a funny uh, part in there where uh, Will Ferrell's character was like a pimp in college or whatever. And it's, it's comedy. It's, it's funny. It's laughable. And then you look at uh, certain music and uh, lyrics, and then you look at movies, and there's this thing that's portrayed that... Uh, being a pimp is like a cool thing, right? And I mean, it's even slang. Like, hey, that's that's pimping, right? right. Oh, that. And right. you may not even mean anything. It may not have anything to do with actual commercial sex work, right? You just say, somebody will say, oh, that's pimp, right? Right. Or uh, pimp my ride. Remember that show, right? right? Yeah, totally. So, so that word has been thrown around a lot in the world for all kinds of folks. And when it comes to young men out there they see these things on social media or they watch movies or they hear music, et cetera. And they're like, well, hold on a minute. If all I really have to do, because remember, like I said, all traffickers are pimps, not all pimps are traffickers. Mm -hmm. You can have a pimp that, let's say you have a victim that's 18 or older, okay? And that pimp literally does nothing besides be a business partner. Provide some protection, mm. okay? Drive somebody around, takes them out to the blade, takes them to hotels, is like an armed security for them, collects mm. their money, manages their money. It all perpetuates to this horrible world, but they may not uh, convince them at all. They might not manipulate right. them. They may not beat them, et cetera. They're still a pimp. And so I spend a lot of time with community groups reminding them to talk to their sons as well about, hey, it may seem like a really good idea, and here's a kicker, and this will kind of, this is, will kind of throw you off maybe, or, or some folks out there. There are a lot of female victims who have been traumatized so much over the years that have been in this game for a long time. They will actually go out and they will find guys who have never been involved in this stuff before, and they'll teach them how to be a pimp. For them. Yes. It's crazy. So you'll have this victim that maybe they're tired of, of their pimp. Maybe their pimp's beating them all the time. But they're not leaving the work. Correct. They're staying in what they're doing, what they know, and they know nothing else. And it's sad. They have not been pulled out of that life yet. And they'll meet a guy 
And then they'll almost influence that guy and say, well, hey, here's how I'm making money. You can be my pimp. Just drive me around. Drive make me sure, around. Yeah, protect me. I'll make give sure. you some of the money. Now, here's the crazy part, though. And <clears throat> what I remind people, the moment that you take proceeds from somebody else's prostitution knowingly. You're now a trafficker. You're a pimp, right? And so when that happens, this young man who might have been, might have been a, a, a high school athlete or had a job or whatever it is, Well, they got thrust into this world and the law doesn't care why or how you got into it. But the fact that you are now out there committing this crime, you can be held responsible for it. Yeah, well, you might be a victim. You're also a perpetrator. 100%. And that's going to change your life. 100%. (laughs) It's crazy. It really is. And, 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 And that's why it's like you have... There's so much to unpack with human trafficking because you have the global world crazy stuff in the movies that happens. And then you have the stuff happening next door and you have everything in between. Mm -hmm. You have different types of relationships. You have um, all all kinds of stuff. Like it's a, it's kind of crazy. So I, let's, let's get into, let's get into California for a second. Just recently we had uh, Senate bill 14 Mm -hmm. uh, that, Well, it ultimately passed, Mm -hmm. but there was a lot of controversy around this as it was being put out there in the beginning. Uh, So it it reaches the Senate floor and basically I think it was six of the Democrats behind it voted it down. This is not a political thing. I'm just telling, I'm giving people the numbers here. Sure. It was on pace to be passed and basically it it was not passed initially. And the bill specifically is about um, counting basically any child sex trafficking as mm-hmm. you could refer to it as like a violent crime. Right. Uh, yeah. and, and it, and it counts in towards California's three strikes law, sure. uh, which is a minimum 25, 25 years, uh, in prison. And so this thing reached the, reached the floor and it was voted down based on, on numbers. Again, I'm just telling the numbers were six Democrats and there was a lot of questions like what the hell is going on here? And yeah. it went like wildfire. Yeah. Wait, 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 we're not supporting a child sex trafficking bill in the state of California, the place is already burning down, quote, Mm. unquote, like what in the hell? Like this is just one more thing. It got a lot of attention. There was a lot of backlash. It reached the governor's office, uh, Newsom, who I'm not a fan of at, at, at any kind of a level. It doesn't matter. I don't think what side of the, the, the lane you're on here. It doesn't matter. My point is, is he stepped up and went, Hey, what is going on? Mm -hmm. Like, this seems like a bill that needs to be passed. And, it came back to this group and they said, well, they, I want to say this. I'm looking at it as an excuse. I don't really know the real reasons. I want to hear your take on this. Yeah. But what it was basically kicked back and said, well, they're looking for really the perfect bill. Well, what is what is not okay about this? And so but they're basically saying these types of bills or these types of laws basically disproportionately impact people of color. Sure. And this is the problem that we've had, much like drug laws and other things here in the in in the state of California. That you know, the pendulum has swung all the way to the left, and it's come all the way back to the right. We we don't want it to be this thing, and so this type of law could disproportionately impact, again, people of color, minorities. Sure. So again, going back to like numbers. Yeah. So th- this was the bill. Ultimately, it went back to the floor with pressure, and it did pass. Right. But I was just like, what in the hell is going on? Like, why Why is this? So they're bringing this up like it disproportionately affects these this certain group of people. So I went through and I went through like the Department of Justice. I'm like, I don't know where else to go to get data anymore. So I'm mm-hmm. just going to try to go to where I think, you know, might be the most legitimate. Um, there has been an, an increase in quote unquote human trafficking and human trafficking convictions year over year. This goes back to 2020. Um, basically, um, just a couple of stats here. Uh, U.S. Attorneys for Human Trafficking Offenses in the fiscal year 2020, there was a 62% increase um, from, and, and, and again, these numbers might surprise people, from 1,360 people to a, just over 2,000 people. Got it. And so people are going, well, as large as a, a population of, of California is, and with all the numbers and statistics get thrown at us, they might be looking at, that's not a very big number. It's 2,000 people, sure. right? That, that, um, that, uh, Again, we're refer, we're referred to for legal cases. This is, this is not all that's happening. This is just what made it to that point. Um, 
the number of prosecuted people for that that time period um, in or sorry increased from 729 to 2011 um, over or in the in the year 2020. So there was an 84 percent increase in a in that in that span of time. So that's a pretty massive increase. Now again, you're looking at the statistics and you're going, well, is that just because we're paying more attention to this? Like what happened? What changed? I don't know. I'm just sure. reading you what the stats that we sure. got reported reported are. The number of persons convicted of a federal human trafficking offense increased from 2011, that which uh, um, to 2019 uh, before falling in 2020. So here's here's this here's the stat. So sorry, federal human trafficking offenses increased from 2011 464 persons mm-hmm. to 2019 837 persons before falling in 2020 back down to 658 persons. I was going, well, maybe we're not paying attention to this. And what were the events of 2020 that may have impacted sure. that? But here's the bigger thing. Going back to the reason this thing wasn't passed, allegedly, again, based on disproportionately affecting certain minorities. Here's the thing. This is where the male thing comes back, back up that I wanted sure. to mention. Of the 1,169 defend, of defendants charged in the U.S. District Court with human trafficking, uh, offenses in the year 2020, 92% of them were male, mm-hmm. 63% of them were white, 18% of them were black, 17% Hispanic, 95% were U.S. citizens, mm-hmm. and 66% had no prior convictions. So there's a few big stats that jumped out, out at me right there. And this is, again, going back to I want your take on what was going on with that bill at the time. Sure. But also, I want to... I think it's it's relevant to bring forward, like there's a lot of things that have been happening at our Southern border that a lot of people have concerns with me included for a lot of different reasons. And I'm wondering, you know, with these numbers and what we're seeing and this manipulation of things in some cases, what have you seen in recent history in terms of how these numbers work out? Like, so let's let's start with the what was going on with the state bill one or fourteen and, and your take on this. Yeah, so <clears throat> super interesting with that bill. There was a a very similar bill that was brought forward uh, by the same senator the year before, and that one didn't get as much attention. And that one was also voted down, uh, I believe, at the same um, level in the rung, if you will. And when I I think back to that particular bill, I, I believe that that bill. Previously, before SB 14, um, did not just focus on child sex trafficking, but also focused on sex trafficking of adults. And so, uh, why that one a year ago or so failed, I, I couldn't tell you. But when it comes to SB 14, I mean, let me lay this in perspective a little bit. There's a list of crimes in the state of California that are considered violent or serious felonies. Those felonies, if convicted, can be considered a strike. One example of those would be if I walk into the mini mart mm-hmm. ac- around the corner from your studio and I go pick up a Snicker bar off the, the rack and I go to walk out with the Snickers bar, the clerk stops me and I push the clerk and he, you know, maybe he cuts his head open on the, the mm-hmm. door frame. That's a robbery. That's a serious and violent offense. However, prior to this, if I sex trafficked a juvenile over and over and over again for however long I wanted to, it was not a serious violence offense. And it's still going through the process right now. It's just luckily has had some good steam going forward. So that's the magnitude of what we're talking about here. There are a list of crimes that are important, but they don't rise to the level of the horribleness that is sex trafficking. So when it comes to how or why this could be voted down, uh, originally, the short answer is I don't know. What I can tell you from my experience, for sure, is that I have investigated cases where exploiters and uh, victims alike are all different races, and so that's what. It, if that becomes part of the conversation, I think that that's somewhat of a misnomer from wherever that comes from because race. What does that have me, to do with it, anything? It, nothing. And it really doesn't, um, in my eyes, in the sense of I have seen victims of all sorts of colors and I've seen exploiters of all sorts of colors. And I think that that's really important for, for people to understand. 
Um, so when you have numbers, you know, that come out there from, especially some of those Fed numbers, what's really interesting, one thing you brought up, you brought up like, you know, this, this 2000 number, like somebody might say, well, you're right. Okay. 2000 people. Is that really that many? Well, first off, I'm going to say, just like you said, that's only the, the convictions that have happened, right? That's not all the cases out there that have gone undetected. And the second thing about that is, so something very interesting, the federal statute does not have pimping and pandering laws. It only has human trafficking laws. And most of the cases that the feds investigate and prosecute are child sex trafficking related. They usually don't investigate crimes uh, that occur against adults with sex trafficking. That's usually handled kind of by more local type of, um, of agencies. So when it comes to federal prosecutions, that 2000 number is only exacerbated by how many uh, are being investigated by local agencies and mm -hmm. they're being prosecuted by district attorney's offices. And then it does not account for pimping and pandering cases. And the thing about pimping and pandering cases most of the time, pimping and pandering cases, they might be trafficking cases that we just weren't able to prove. Just haven't gotten there with it. We yet. couldn't. We we could prove that there was an exchange of money. We could prove uh, that somebody encouraged somebody, or drove them around, or got them into that lifestyle. But in California, if the victim is over eighteen years old, we have to prove this thing called deprivation of liberty which is this idea that somebody's freedom was essentially taken away from them to make the decision to become mm -hmm. uh, involved in, in commercial sex trafficking. That can be done through a myriad of things, force, fear, uh, fraud, coercion, et cetera. And that leaves so much wide open. Whew, I'm telling you. So I'm, I'm very glad that uh, SB 14 is, is on the right track. Um, when you break down... Uh, some of the other laws that are in that list of violent and serious, uh, there's there's no doubt that child sex trafficking should be in there. One thing that I did read quite about uh, SB 14, um, that is a very interesting point and, and kind of deserves some conversation, is people who, that were against it claimed that that law would um, somehow put victims in the crosshairs, yeah, right? That was another piece. That yes. was another piece where people were like, well, if we have these strict laws, we as a criminal justice system are going to get it wrong a lot of times. And some of these people that are victims are going to be seen as the exploiters. Going back to the young man example who starts taking money from, you know, a to for driving somebody around. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, or even, and and I've had cases like this where a lot of time the female pimps that we see out there, because that's another thing that we got to remember, there are female exploiters and, and make no mistake about it. A, a bad and unfortunate part about that though is a lot of times they started as victims, okay? And they may be even getting victimized by an exploiter while they are out Doing victimizing it. other people, right? And it's like this cycle and it's almost this um, hierarchy that happens. So one of the things about SB 14 or, or making laws stricter is this conversation and concern that, you know, us as cops and just the, the system in general, we're going to get it wrong and we're going to end up putting victims in prison. That's a legit concern, man. It is. But I'll say this. We're pretty good in law enforcement about recognizing when somebody's a victim and when somebody's an exploiter. And I have a case, and in this one, I think about this one quite a bit because I got almost two bites at the apple, or I I, I had a, a good chance um, to try to help somebody, and it didn't work. And it, it was a particular case where uh, a young lady, um, not a troubled past, one of those ones, right. Uh, met somebody who ended up kind of talking to her in this idea about going out there. There was no no violence in this relationship. It was uh, very kind of manipulative based, um, money based, and I ended up investigating that case. Um, and that guy got convicted of pimping. Well, fast forward a couple of years later, because he wasn't in custody for very long, unfortunately, they were back together. But now she was out trafficking a seventeen year old. Now, 
was it ultimately for his bidding and and his control and in their hierarchy? The answer is yes. Yeah, but she's the middle person. But she ended up being held accountable for that. And I'll never forget uh, a judge saying, like, hey, uh, calling her by her name in, in court and saying, we a, a year or two ago, like we we tried to we looking out we, for we, we tried to we tried to do everything we could to get to help you, right? We we held somebody accountable. However, you decided to continue that lifestyle and then you became accountable for some of your actions. So that does exist. But ultimately, I would argue that um, the value of making child sex trafficking a serious and violent offense, it, it far outweighs any of the concerns. Um, I, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to the politics involved mm-hmm. or or some of those things because frankly, law enforcement and politics don't mix well. And I, I just, I try to tell people and and that's where, you know, I, I spend a lot of time talking to police officers. Um, and, and this is a, a huge conversation for investigating human trafficking anyway. It can be very um, discouraging at times because you feel like the victims don't want help. You feel like the laws don't support you. Uh, you feel like you you're hitting your head against the wall. It's mm-hmm. a dead end. It's like a circular conversation. Yeah, it's huge, man. It's hard. Um, but at the very end of the day, if if we don't as cops continue to go out there, we don't continue to look for this. We don't continue to spread our message. We don't continue to educate the public. We don't continue to to really try to help people make a difference, hold exploiters accountable. Then then we're not doing our job, and and we're just saying that it's okay. So. Um, to kind of wrap up that, that, that SB 14 conversation, uh, I'm super glad that it got attention. I mean, like Joe Rogan was talking yeah. about it. Like it, it went, it went deep. It, it, I mean, it started, I even mentioned it. I'm at fault at doing this. It just, I was just trying to give perspective on like, who's not voting for this. And it was wild that it was like there, again, it was from the democratic side, there were six of them on this particular, sure on this particular project and they all voted no. And that's what it turned into. It turned into the Democrats were trying to protect sex trafficking. I didn't believe that for two no. seconds. I'm more on the on the on the line of was like they're trying to maybe write something else into this bill, not not make it more specific, but write something else into it, sneak it in the back door or something like that. Cause we've seen that happen so much so many times at both state, local, state, and federal <laughs> at the federal level. So I was just kind of expecting for that shoe to drop. Yeah. Um, but and but yes, it took off like wildfire. Well, and that's the thing is, you know, I um in the human trafficking world and the space that I work, I work with all kinds of different folks, right? And I, I work with folks that are on different sides of the the political um, ideology. I work with just, if you name uh, the you, type of folks, I work with everybody. You and, have to. And, I lo- and it's huge. I love doing it right. too. And I, I have grown so much over the years. Uh, I have not met Anybody, regardless of what side of the aisle they're on, that likes sex trafficking. Yeah. <laughs> and it, and it, what, what I hate is I hate that it gets polarized in, into this topic where, I mean, it, I, I can guarantee you if you pull 100 people and of all sorts of different walks of life and political beliefs and you ask them, do you believe in child sex trafficking? I think 100 out of 100, you're going to say no. So it's like, you know, that that's what becomes difficult is, you know, we're we're constantly kind of in this this battle of, of politics when when really we shouldn't. Right, specifically on this matter. I, I, so going, the, the other question there, and I folded this in, it was a lot, but going back to like what you're seeing now in terms of patterns, or is there anything different happening at this stage in Northern California, yeah. right, with regard to what's happened at our border, yeah, and th- that being our Southern border, and what we know is a large amount of people are coming across by what means, whatever, that's not what I'm talking about. We sure. just know there's a lot of new people coming in. Again, so there's going to be opportunity. There's going to be desperation. Many of those people are being trafficked yeah. across the border. We know this. This is this is how this process works. Our process here for bringing people in is fucking broken. Sure. Um, it's way behind. Uh, it's going to have to be blown up and probably recreated to fix any of this, among other things. That's not what I'm asking. That's not what this discussion is about. It's sure. like... Are you seeing things differently? Are there are there things coming in here where we're going? These people are from different countries, yeah. Or and or are we seeing victims coming from places where you're like this person this this person is not from around here? Yeah, you know the the interesting thing. Is, so we we've talked a lot about sex trafficking, but there is a whole another side of human trafficking. That's where I'm going, with which this. is labor trafficking. Yeah, that's where I'm going with this. And uh, and and there's also a lot of crossover that happens between sex and labor trafficking. 
Uh, probably the best example I can give are illicit massage parlors, right? And I've investigated a lot of those where you have these uh, women that are coming from other countries, a lot of times from uh, Asian countries that are brought here on this promise of, of you know, you're going to go to the promised land and live this great life. And then when they get here, they have their passport taken and they're shoved into uh, what you would think is a massage parlor, but is really just a, a brothel. Um, and they're forced to, to have sex uh, for money. Uh, we have people that are forced to work out in fields. We have poor people that are forced to work on street corners at booths. Uh, people that are forced to work in uh, nanny type jobs. I, I know of a case, um, I, I worked really closely with a, a deputy district attorney for a lot of years in the human trafficking world. And, and she had a particular case where somebody uh, was labor trafficked that was a nanny that was basically you know, brought over here to what they thought was work. But then next thing you know, they're living in a little tiny closet, working 20 hours a day for no pay. Uh, I've investigated cases um, of people coming over here to certain religious establishments that are forced to work there. So I, I think you bring up a really good point in, in that, you know, there is a, a global aspect to that. And, you know, when you, when you start bringing in um, all these different factors, it makes it kind of hard for law enforcement, especially local law enforcement, because we we have to really kind of learn about all these different cultures, which I think is great and important. But a lot of these things are wound into some of these cultures. And if we're not educated on that, it becomes very difficult. So it, it brings even this, this new echelon where not only do we have to pay attention and worry about a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about, you know, kind of the homegrown, what's going on inside of our communities, this pimping, pandering, human trafficking world. But now you have kind of this, this these whole other elements um, that just, that bring victims, you know, in into the fold. So and definitely a, a good point. I mean, there's, there, there's a lot to unpack for sure. So we talked a little bit about like, as you're a parent and kind of keeping an eye on your kids. What about just... I mean, and I, I painted a picture or at least told a story. This was very real to me because I watched it happen. I mean, when I was watching it happen, I'd never spent the night in the gym before on the couch watching out my front window what was really going on on the street. And as soon as the, the, you know, the sun went down, I hit about 10, 11 o'clock. I was like, where are all these people coming from? What is this? And it was very obvious to me uh, again, but most people are in bed at sure. 11 o'clock at sure. night, right? So they weren't seeing it either. And while it was happening the entire time, we had heard some stories and seen some things until you see it for your, with your own eyes and you start seeing hand-to-hand -hand stuff happen and whatever else. You're like, holy shit, this is a, this is a bigger problem. Um, then you you become almost hyper-aware. And, you know, one of the lessons on the show is, is just being prepared, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and that being prepared in a lot of different levels. And the, one of the most important things you can do is be aware. Sure. You, you're not going to be prepared unless you're aware of what to be prepared for. And so I wonder, like, as a member of a community, mm -hmm. you know, what are things, whether that's urban, rural, a uh, work community, you know, or like in a, in a workplace, in a school, it, those are all in a, even in a, in a, you mentioned like religious establishments, sure. churches, things like that, because these things, they're not immune to these problems. Sure. What can you tell the, the community in terms of being aware? What are things that they can look out for uh, to be vigilant yeah. and, and just... And, and maybe make a difference on the whole. So the, one of my favorite phrases to, to use is we must not panic, but we have to be aware. And I kind of started using that uh, a few years back, talking to our, our city council and, and other groups that I've spoken to is, you know, we, I don't want people to hear us talking today or hear, you know, anybody talking about this stuff and almost feel helpless or pull this like, red handle of panic and mm. fear. Cause the truth is, is it's not like, um, you know, the likelihood of, of this stuff touching or affecting your family is very low. With that being said, you do have to be aware of it because it can sneak in there without you knowing it or without you paying attention. Yeah. You're living this every day. hundred percent. So for, uh, for our community members, there's a few things I always talk about. The, the first thing is being aware and getting educated like we have together today about what this stuff is. That's kind of number one, like that it's, it's prevalent, it's here, it's around us. It takes different forms, um, but there's no typical victim. There's no typical exploiter, but there are some themes that they do go in there, especially with victims like we talked about coming from 
hard times, broken homes, drug abuse, stuff like that. So the first thing is a, a person is to get educated and get educated correctly, right? Don't don't rely on a movie like Taken or Sound of Freedom to give you your 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 baseline knowledge. Solid point, man. So don't 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 do that. Like watch it, um, but then go and the best thing you can do is there are so many good local organizations, no matter where you live. There's also a lot of really awesome national organizations. Uh, I'm a law enforcement advisor for one of those called Truckers Against Trafficking. Really cool uh, North American organization that works with the transportation industry. And it's pretty cool. They've trained over a million drivers in the U.S. to recognize the signs and symptoms of wow. human trafficking and then how to properly report that to law enforcement. Um, so that's a kind of a new venture that I've taken off on with them. They've been around for uh, well over a decade, great organization. But in in all of our our cities and towns, there are local organizations that if you just did a simple Google search and you typed in local human trafficking nonprofit, some nonprofits are really strong, some aren't as strong, but what you get at the local level is the likelihood of there being real survivors built into those ecosystems. And when you have real survivors that have lived this trauma, that have lived this horrible life, they're able to bring perspectives. Mm. They're able to bring knowledge and training. And if you support those organizations, you find the right one, you do your research, whether you support them monetarily or you go out and volunteer, et cetera, it's a really good way to get educated on what it really is, as well as kind of being able to help in, in some sort of way. So I think education's key. I think finding a way to help is absolutely key. And the other component to that is the best nucleus that you can ever have is your family. Mm -hmm. And in that, I mean, that doesn't just go for, for this horrible topic we're talking about. We know that, 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 uh, constantly, you know, I've talking to so many people in my 13 year career, uh, whether it's sex trafficking or, or anything else, uh, criminal related, and I've had some really good conversations with people over the years that have committed crimes. And I've talked about what their past looked like, their childhood looked like. And almost always, there's something bad that happened. There was a broken home. Somebody wasn't around. They weren't being paid attention, whatever. So if we can recognize that the first offense to this, sex trafficking or anything else, is how we raise our kids, how we be there for our kids, how we monitor what our kids are doing, and we teach them values and, and we don't lie to them. I think that's really important. We don't lie to them. And, you know, you brought up like earlier, you know, do I really want to take my 11 or 12 year old to go see Sound of Freedom, something like that? That is so kind of crazy where, you know, these, these young six, seven year olds are being raped. Mm -hmm. um, the answer is maybe not. Um, but there are a, a lot of things you can do and type into like YouTube and look up survivor stories that may not be as graphic. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to, uh, a, a woman that I haven't met personally, um, uh, but I've heard her story and I've read her book. Her name's Rebecca Bender and she wrote an awesome book, um, that if you type in Rebecca Bender story on Google, it'll come up with her book and it is kind of her autobiography of being sex trafficked. And she was just a normal girl in the United States that went through some things. Um, and it tells her story about being sex trafficked in Las Vegas and how she got through that, how she got out of the life, et cetera. Those are the kind of stories that I think at, at the proper age, you educate your, uh, your, our kids and our, our kind of our friends, our neighbors, our family members on and I always recommend reading or hearing a story from a local survivor because it, it'll kind of knock your socks off in the sense of like, wow, how strong these people are that have been through the stuff they've been through. Uh, but it's really important to, to allow those stories to be your baseline knowledge, not the Hollywood theatrics. Just in talking about the concept of family and survivorship and the stories that you've, you know, you've, you've heard and I wonder what are the long-term things that happen here, you know, as you're working through these cases and you come out the other side. I mean, is there, is there any room or is there any chance for follow-up on how some of these people have come out the other side? What's the reality of this? Yeah. I mean, uh, I won't sugarcoat it. It, it doesn't always go well. 
and a lot of times it doesn't. And, you know, the, the biggest thing that <clears throat> I, I try to dispel a, a little bit is, you know, sometimes in law enforcement, the terminology we use when we're talking about sex trafficking and victims, we use kind of incorrectly. And I'll use one term, rescue being one. Very uh, rarely does law enforcement rescue somebody from sex trafficking. And what I mean is this, you know, the, the story I told you about uh, the girl who's kidnapped, right? That's pretty, pretty rare example. She, she was rescued by cops that day that came to that, that, restaurant. that restaurant and grabbed her, right? And, and I, I believe that. But the 99 out of the other 100 times where a, a trafficking case or a pimping case is investigated, we as law enforcement, it's our job to work with other entities like victim advocates and nonprofits to lay the path for a victim to be able to be taken out of that situation. Correct. But guess who has to make the decision? They do. Yeah, they do. And I don't care if that's a, a juvenile or an adult. Of course, as a juvenile, we have a little bit more rules. We right. can, we can f like almost physically pull that person away from there, get them back to home or back to wherever they were supposed to be. But a lot of times they run away again, sadly. That decision, and, and that's something I'm really big on, is when you hear survivors, a lot of times they'll talk about the, the power that they finally felt to make that decision to get out of that lifestyle. So there are cases where I've done follow-up and checked in on people, and there's been some success stories. Uh, one individual, um, she, and, and I credit this to the victim advocate that I work with on this case, I spent a lot of time working with this particular victim um, who, uh, when I first met her, wanted absolutely nothing to do with me. Uh, but through a series of interviews and time spent, she opened up to me. And then eventually she opened up to the victim advocate that I worked with on this case. She got out of the lifestyle. She had some kids. Uh, she got a job, stuff like that. So the cool thing is, is that feeling of like success a little bit. But the vast majority, sadly, of victims that I've helped or tried to help over the years, a lot of times they get back into the lifestyle. Yeah. And so I, I don't want to sugarcoat it for either cops out there or just people in general that there's always this warm, fuzzy feeling at the conclusion of these cases. Uh, we saved one. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of rare sometimes. Uh, but what I always say is even if if A, we've done everything we can for that victim to lay the groundwork for them to get out. But then B, if we've taken that exploiter off the streets, then maybe that's one less person that's going to get manipulated into this game or forced into this game. So for me, that that is where the end result lies that's the too. Win. That's yeah. the win. That's that's tough, man. I mean, I think the next part to ask is this would be the next natural question, is how does this affect somebody like you, you know, the officers that are involved in, in going home to, at the end of the day, I mean, being, being in this line of work already comes with its own set of, yeah. of challenges. Right. But I mean, when you're dealing with in, in issues like this, where, you know, at times you're, you're trying to help somebody that maybe doesn't necessarily want to help or, and then very specifically as we're working the kids, I have 14 years old. That's a fucking kid. That is, that is, I feel very strongly about that. These are people that do that are not fully wired up top. They maybe they have or haven't had poor experiences, great influences or whatever else. All the more reasons why I think that word kid, child makes even more sense to me, at least. Some people may disagree with that and I know they do. This is a highly charged debate sure. right now. But when you're dealing with the kids, um, and you're just dealing with these young people, yeah. you know, and you're, already talked about the traumas that they've already experienced and what they'll they'll have to deal with for the rest of their life how do you go home with that every day man how do you how do you deal with it how does how do you process it i mean for and this would be i'd be lying if i said i wasn't asking out of my own you know personal curiosity yeah. but i talked to a lot of officers that deal with a lot of shit on a regular basis and you know trying to be some level of an advocate for the mental and emotional health side of things what 
what advice do you have for other people that are doing what you're doing that may trickle over into, you know, the population of people that are, have been victimized by this or suffering? Yeah. And, and <clears throat> it's certainly appreciated on a forum like this, you know, I've caught several other podcasts where this st- kind of stuff comes up, right. And you talk about officer wellness and, you know, you ask officers kind of how they, they cope with things. And I, I think everybody uh, does a little bit differently, but um, I, I think that there are some, some basics, um, Number one, physical fitness is huge. Having that outlet, right? Um, I think that when you you take care of yourself physically, you're going to be able to perform better mentally. You're going to be able to make decisions better. And if you can have that outlet, whether that's weightlifting or running or jujitsu or whatever it is, like that allows you to kind of uh, escape your thoughts and do something hard, right? Mm-hmm. Do something difficult, you know? And and I, I think that that's huge and that's crucial. The other thing is, is for a long time, the, the notion of talking about feelings and talking about what you go through was very stigmatized in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. That's changed a lot. And, you know, I work, I work with and around a lot of type A people, right? I've, uh, comes to the territory. A hundred percent. And, and a lot of times, um, you know, my career has taken me a lot of great places. I've lived in the tactical world for many years. Um, I've, I've been on a SWAT team for a decade. I run a SWAT team. I work with other SWAT teams all around um, what you would think are these, you know, type A, macho guys, et cetera. Hard chargers, right? Hard chargers. And uh, what I've found is, you know, talking to them that they are more open almost than anybody else about being open about how they feel. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the notion that, um, that you shouldn't talk about how you feel, that, that shouldn't be a part of your, your mental kind of thought process. Um, I, I have a, a great support system, both in law enforcement and out. That's so important. I think it's crucial. Yeah, it's so important. I think it's really crucial. And I think it's great to have people that you can relate to that have maybe experienced the same things, but at the same time, like, you know, it's just like, it's just like anything else. If, if a a baseball player only hangs out with baseball players and only knows baseball, well, they're not going to get, you know, exposed or experienced to other parts of life. Well, it's the same thing for cops. And I really encourage cops to challenge themselves a little bit at times. And, you know, uh, go, go hang out with your, your friend you haven't seen for a while or go, um, hang out with people that aren't cops, your neighbors that, you know, uh, work at whatever X, Y, Z, you know, go, go watch the football game with them. Cause guess what? If, if I go hang out with my cop buddies, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to talk about cop stuff, (laughs) about cop stuff, man. And and I, uh, I love it. But, um, so I think physical fitness is huge. I think, uh, understanding that, we as, as police officers, just like anybody else in the world, um, you know, we go through trauma, whether it's acute incidents that happen um, or kind of these overall things that kind of stack up on you. Uh, it absolutely sucks seeing some of the things that I have to see um, as well as my, that my peers have had to see, uh, whether it's at a call for service or I'm looking at something in a cell phone that uh, I have to for evidence sake and just seeing what uh, kind of the worst of the worst can mm-hmm. be and, and what people go through. But the light at the end of the tunnel is if we don't, who will? Right. And I'm a true believer uh, in this profession. Um, I'm a believer in, in right and wrong and, and doing the right thing and helping people. Um, knowing that there's challenges and things aren't going to always go right. Knowing that we're going to fail. Um, and that's okay. I think it's important to acknowledge, man. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I talk about all the time and and when I teach for sex trafficking specifically, literally there'll be points of my presentations or my talks or speaking where I'll like give a date and say, don't do what I did on March 16th of 2022, where I made this bad call. And I, I think it's extremely important to own those mistakes to, to live through them, to move on. Um, and I think that that's what makes us better. And overall, I'm happy to see kind of law enforcement lose some of that stigma that we've had about uh, not being able to talk about, you know, the things that we go through. Cause I mean, if you don't, that, that stuff will kind of boil up. Yeah. I think a lot of people are questioning, you know, like how much more can they take, you sure. know, with, with a lot of this stuff, it's, uh, 
it's an interesting profession. I know. Uh, it's a uh, it's a tough it's a tough one. I think it'll uh, at times, and I think um, particularly now, just again hanging around people that are doing it, they're they're faced with new problems every day. That you know, and things are changing, and uh, it seems like you're you're going with the flow. Like you're understanding that changes need to be made. We've just talked about sort of the mental uh, emotional health piece of that and, and acknowledging some of the things that go along with that. I just, as you continue to evolve here, cause we're in this, what, 13 years, I think was the number. Sure. Uh, you're a young man, right? I mean, and the, the, the profession has evolved. The, the type of casework that you do is obviously evolving. Where do you see this going for you, man? Do you just, is there, what happens now? I mean, you just keep going out and just yeah. plugging away. Yeah. Or, so, you know, what does it look like now? So, uh, you know, for for me personally, the the kind of tides just through um, p- different positions and kind of where I see uh, the hopeful trajectory of my career going. Um, I'm becoming less of the doer of work and more of the person who can hopefully help influence and mold and teach and mentor the next generation of people to do this work. Um, I have uh, guys at my agency and others that I've worked in, um, in the task force at other agencies around me um, that are far better investigators than I ever was. And to see where they're going and to see the passion that they have and to hope that I had some influence on that, that that's really the, the, what, what kind of keeps me going, that keeps me motivated. The other point to that is I'm a huge believer in building relationships. And I've learned the hard way through these years of doing this work that cops cannot do it alone. You have to have a good relationship with your district attorney's office, with your victim advocates, with your outside agencies, with your survivors, with your victims. Uh, You have to learn how to build rapport with the exploiters when you talk to them and interview them. So it all comes down to the ability to build relationships. Well, us in law enforcement, it can be difficult for us to build relationships with people outside of law enforcement. And that's just because of the experiences that we go through. And we tend to kind of navigate towards ourselves. Well, in sex trafficking, in order to combat that correctly, that doesn't work. So my mission as I continue forward and I become involved in, in hopefully um, more big picture conversations is bridging those gaps between uh, law enforcement and other entities. And then just kind of constantly having that, that glass half full mentality, mm-hmm. which is tough in this profession at mm-hmm. times. I know? can't imagine. Um, I can either look at this as, well, we're never really going to change anything. It's just going to keep going. And, you know, this person doesn't want my help anyway. Or I can look at it as, well, she may not want my help today, but maybe she will tomorrow. But at least if I get this person out of the equation and held accountable, then that's one less person that that person can now go out and traffic. And maybe now through that, I've influenced or or mentored or motivated another police officer to be like, you know what? Uh, I, I see the value in, in that Planted work. The seed. So uh, for me, I, I think the journey's just started. Um, I, I've been lucky enough to, to work in the trenches, to have good days, to have bad days, to run operations, to travel the state. I'll continue to teach. I'll continue to spread the message, keep having conversations like this, and just keep trucking forward. Well, I, where do you encourage people to go to learn more about this? I mean, you mentioned like the YouTube stuff. Sure. You mentioned like uh, the, the the trucker organization. Yeah. I forget what that was. But if, you know, for people to maybe learn more about you, but also learn more about this, the this, world. this thing. Yeah, yeah this, sure. this whole thing. And maybe be able to, I mean, because we talked about the most important thing is get educated and become aware. And then once you do that, just like we're trying to do here today is give it to somebody else. Yeah. or at least encourage them to go down the path of, of learning more so that they can be more aware and then maybe educate somebody else. Where, where, do, where do you send people? Yeah, so for first and foremost, uh, I would encourage you to research uh, in your local area. Find organizations that um, are nonprofits that work directly with the community that you're involved in. Um, talk to other people that have been involved in that. Talk to police officers as you, as you are in your daily uh, kind of routine. 
ask about these organizations and find what would be the best fit. Uh, kind of in our area, the one that I work with the most is called Community Violence Solutions, CVS. It's a really good nonprofit. Uh, I've worked with a ton of their advocates. So certainly that's one resource if you're in the Bay Area. Um, on a national level, there's a lot of different organizations, right? Um, OUR uh, is the one that everybody's most familiar with. They're the ones that were kind of behind Sound of Freedom. Mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of resources. There's another one called Polaris. They have a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. And depending on who you talk to, there's different beliefs on both those organizations, just like there are all of them. I, I, don't, I don't really get into that. I, I just, I figure... There's value in value in learning, right. and and all of these different national organizations are are gonna have um, educational tips for people to understand what sex trafficking is. Um, I work directly with Truckers Against Trafficking, um, and they are awesome in the transportation industry, and and really more than that, uh, they're a really good one to check out. Um, I'm always available to anybody and everybody in this conversation. Uh, very active on LinkedIn. Uh, Kyle Baker just searched and then probably human trafficking and it'll pop right up. Uh, very reachable on there. Um, I'm lucky enough now to to kind of be traveling a little bit more of a conference down in Palm Springs in September. Um, another speaking engagement in December uh, down in LA. So um, I, I'm starting to kind of see uh, my roots spread out a little bit more, which is is really awesome. And, and I hope to continue to do that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to anybody. Uh, I, I'm not afraid to take difficult conversation or difficult questions from anybody, uh, from any set of backgrounds or beliefs, um, you know, including people that may have a, a negative view of law enforcement. Version, yeah. Those are my favorite conversations, to be honest with you, is... is Biggest opportunity. Well, why... I mean, if, if you already like law enforcement, what do I really have to convince you of? I'm trying to sell you on anything. Right. Yeah. I would rather talk to somebody who has their apprehensions and hopefully through that conversation, they realize that well, I'm just a human being out there trying to do a job that I believe matters and I can have a dialogue with you and we can find a way to connect. Yeah. I had this conversation with another law enforcement officer, not more than a week ago, similar. It was basically like, look, my, my biggest payday is when I get a, somebody that absolutely hates cops. But at the end of the day, you can go, I might not like cops, but you got it right, you know, as the cop you know, today, or, or whatever, whatever the case is, it sees it as a, as a challenge yeah. you know, on, a, on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, look, man, uh, you know, before we, before we sign off here, I want to publicly thank you for this, uh, <laughs> this water bottle that's sitting on my desk. Yeah. Like, uh, what an awesome gift. Uh, there's so many cool things about it. Let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, man. So, uh, I know I kept, uh, I kept looking over quite a bit. So uh, actually one of, one of my bosses, uh, super good guy, Will Hatcher, he just started uh, his own little LLC called uh, Blended Grain. Uh, they're on Instagram. And so he's doing uh, all these different kind of uh, etching projects. And uh, I, I told him I wanted him to make uh, something a little special for you if, to, to thank you for having me on and, and having this conversation. So uh, he, he basically took, you know, your, your two platforms, your, your businesses, red dot fitness and iron sides created. He's got the beard on there and everything, awesome, man, man, looking, yeah. looking super fierce. <laughs> um, and then he kind of created, uh, this, this inhuman trafficking, um, kind of graphic with, uh, the barcode and then, uh, uh, a female figure on it. And what's really interesting about this one too, is, you know, a, a lot of the, the human trafficking, maybe ads or graphics, et cetera, that you see are a lot of times like, um, somebody behind bars or like a little a girl or, or a cage or something like that. Well, I mean, this, this graphic is kind of more portrayed because it has some, uh, a, a woman that is wearing kind of these, um, you know, in a, like a dress or whatever. And that's kind of the reality more or less is, you know, you, you see these things and it goes back to that conversation about, you know, how they're, how people are kind of that glamorizing themselves on social media. Um, so I, I, I totally dig kind of this, this realistic, uh, graphic he did. And, um, so yeah, people can find him at a uh, blended grain. He can do absolutely anything, uh, on these water bottles, man. So I'm, I'm glad you dig it. Well, yeah. Well, thanks man for bringing it down. It's amazing. It's, it'll be the new, uh, it'll be the new staple. It feels yeah. a little, it's, it's awesome to see the, the logos on something and, uh, uh, thanks for taking the time to put it together. Sure. And uh, and lastly, obviously, for helping spread the message. 
And having this conversation with me today, I needed to have it. Uh, you know, so again, this is a lot of this, 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 this show is personal to me. That's why, that's why I started the journey, but it was to, it was to reach out and talk to folks just like you who, who could, who could enlighten me on kind of the realities of the situation out there, have the difficult conversations, um, you know, be asked questions that, you know, I, I think a lot of other people have. That was always my hunch in starting the show. Is like, I think I have some questions that other people, other people probably have. And if I had these conversations and we recorded them, I bet people would might be interested in them. And it's, you know, my, my intuition there kind of has paid off. And I really hope, you know, with this one that people, you know, hang in there with it and they listen to all the things that you said and then take it to the next level. Because that's where it started with me. It was like, and I don't know what, with all the information that's out there. And again, I don't, it's kind of like this invisible thing, unless you're, you're really paying attention. Um, I, I just, you know, probably in the last year have just become way more aware of it and you helped me fill in some gaps. And I'm hoping whether you filled in some gaps for some people today, or you made them completely aware of something they had no idea about, or it encourages them to go have the conversation with their 14 year old today you know, or whenever they hear this, you know, with how to, how to look out for things or just check in, sure. you know, how you doing, you know, or pay attention so that it doesn't happen to them or that they can make, maybe help prevent it from happening to somebody else. But again, man, thanks for taking time out of your day, coming down and spending time with you. I appreciate you, man. Yeah, Scott, thank you. And, and, uh, I think it was crucial to have this conversation. And, and the last thing I'll leave is just that notion of, you know, we must not panic, but we have to be aware. And, uh, conversations like this are the first part of that. So thanks again for having me. Right on, man.